sociology is a comparatively young academic discipline, yet its influence upon modern criminology and contributions to theoretical explanations of non-standard behavior have been more extensive and enduring than the preceding theories of biological determinism and psychological maladjustment. Despite some meaningful contributions to our understanding, the biological and psychological explanations neglect the most prominent aspect of deviance. That is, like any other human activity, deviant behavior is inherently social in nature. For an individual to be deviant or antisocial, he or she must be involved with other people. In this session, we we'll look at two categories of sociological theories of wrongdoing. Note how these theories, social strain and cultural transmission, unlike the biological and psychogenic theories, look beyond the individual in seeking causal explanations and place juveniles and their behavior in a larger sociological context for understanding. What is sociological explanation? There is a fundamental tension between so-called initiative or common sense, explanations of social events and basic sociological approaches to explanation. The former starts with individuals and their motives, while sociologists start with organizations and higher levels of abstraction. Common sense seems to tell us that people are the most fundamental unit of society, and so understanding an event requires understanding the motives of the particular people involved that is wrong on three counts. First, in modern developed societies, not only have organizations have become numerous and complex, they are also the locus of power and they control income and social status. Government agencies, hospitals, corporations, unions, schools, universities and countless other organizations dominate society and influence all social events. They are the most fundamental components of any society. It therefore seems self-evident that explanations of social events must focus on organizations, not their individual members. Second, we can never fully grasp all traits of unique people. We can only grasp a few attributes of any person that time. In fact, any subject matter can be represented only as a set of attributes. Analysis literally means to break something into its components such as the person's age, gender, moodiness or aggressiveness. This approach is no different than distilling a political organization into its components, that is, size membership composition, location and the like. Since there is no difference between analyzing individuals and analyzing organizations, one is no more important or fundamental than the other. Third, if human beings are no more fundamental than nor different from any other set of attributes, they require no special theories or methods. There is no merit to the idea that an explanation is incomplete unless it accounts for human motives. So-called motivations add little to an explanation. We do not need to understand a fly's motives to predict that it will attempt to avoid the fly sweater. Any attempt to reduce social events to individual motivations only opens the door to an endless deduction cycle that can stop only at biochemical explanations. So-called motivations can be explained by a series of causal hypotheses based on speculative assumptions. For example, a neighbor is observed gathering wood and taking it into his house. One can only guess that the motive is to start a fire in the fireplace to keep warm. But many other guesses are possible example, he is planning to burn down the house. The best explanation is determined by information about probabilities of each course of action and does not require any special methods. Even the person's assertions about his motives may turn out to be misleading. We know that social causation occurs independently of individual motivations. For example, overcrowding in cities does not intentionally cause disease. And with the best of motives, a government program to hire the unemployed in Detroit attracted more job seekers and raised the unemployment rate. 
Also many years ago, government program that increased benefits for the elderly raised their income to a level that disqualified many of them for free health insurance. Suppose we want to know why people panic in emergencies. The search for motives would focus on each individual's perceptions and predispositions. A simple explanation would measure the ratio between the population's size and the number of available exi exits. Therefore, the most fruitful and efficient to explanation of social events concentrates on relationships between organizations and their membership and relationships among organizations. This does not mean it is useless to examine mental constructs and other intervening processes. However, the fact remains that it is justifiable to ignore them. Otherwise, we would be committed to the impossible task of trying to account for endless chains of intervening variables. Incompleteness is inherent in the analytic process. It is not necessary to predict the feeling, motives or behavior of particular individuals. What matters is the outcome of their actions and how the outcomes are distributed. For example, suppose that in a large school district, some high schools have recently hired more teachers with special math training. This changes the distribution of schools with more of the specialized schools at the top to the distribution and fewer at the bottom. One question is whether the distribution students in the district who are able to demonstrate math skills being taught has also changed, whether there are more students in the top part of the test distribution. Theories in sociological explanation. Structural strain theory. Robert K. Merton developed the structural strain theory as an extension of the functionalist perspective on deviance. This theory traces the origins of deviance to the tensions that are caused by the gap between cultural goals and the means people have available to achieve those goals. According to the structural strain theory, societies are characterized by both culture and social structure. Culture establishes goals for people in society while social structure provides or fails to provide the means for people to achieve those goals. In a well-integrated society, people use accepted and appropriate means to achieve the goals that society establishes. In this case, the goals and the means of the society are in balance. It is when the goals and means are not in balance with each other that deviance is likely to occur. This imbalance between cultural goals and structurally available means can actually lead an individual into deviant behavior. Merton also classified people into five general categories with regards to their relationship to culturally accepted goals and the means to achieving those goals. Conformists are people who believe in both the established cultural goals of society as well as the normative means for attaining those goals. They follow the rules of society. Ritualists are individuals who do not believe in the established cultural goals of society, but they do believe in and abide by the means for attaining those goals. Innovators are those individuals that accept the cultural goals of society, but reject the conventional methods of attaining those goals. These people usually have a obvious disregard for the conventional methods that have been established in attaining wealth and are generally those we regard as criminals. Retreatists are individuals who reject both the cultural goals and the accepted means of attaining those goals. They simply avoid both the goals and means established by society without replacing those norms with their own counter-cultural forces. Rebels not only reject both the established cultural goals and the accepted means of attaining those goals, but they substitute new goals and new means of attaining those goals. Labeling theory. Labeling theory is one of the most important approaches to understanding deviant and criminal behavior within sociology. Labeling theory begins with the assumption that no act is intrinsically criminal. Definitions of criminality are established by those in power through the formulation of laws and the interpretation of those laws by police, courts, and correctional institutions. Deviance is therefore not a set of characteristics of individuals or groups, but rather it is a process of interaction between deviants and non-deviants and the context in which criminality is being interpreted. 
those who represent forces of law and order and those who enforce the boundaries of proper behavior such as the police court officials experts and school authorities provide the main source of labeling by applying labels to people and in the process creating categories of deviants these people are reinforcing the power structure of society many of the rules that define deviants and the context in which deviant behavior is labeled as deviant are framed by the wealthy for the poor by men for women by older people for younger people and by ethnic minorities for minority groups in other words the more powerful and dominant groups in society create and apply deviant labels to the subordinate groups social control theory social control theory developed by travis harkey is a type of functionalist theory that suggests that deviance occurs when a person's or group's attachment to social bonds is weakened according to this view people care about what others think of them and conform to social expectations because of their attachment to others and what others expect of them socialization is important in producing conformity to social rules and it is when this conformity is broken that deviance occurs social control theory focuses on how deviants are attached or not to common value systems and what situations break people's commitment to these values this theory also suggests that most people probably feel some impulse towards deviant behavior at some time but their attachment to social norms prevents them from actually participating in deviant behavior theory of differential association the theory of differential association is a learning theory that focuses on the processes by which individuals come to commit deviant or criminal acts according to the theory created by edwin h sutherland criminal behavior is learned through interactions with other people through this interaction and communication people learn the values attitudes techniques and motives for criminal behavior differential association theory emphasizes the interaction people have with their peers and others in their environment those who associate with delinquents deviants or criminals learn to value deviants the greater the frequency duration and intensity of their immersion in deviant environments the more likely it is that they will become deviant this theory really focuses on how people become criminals not why they become criminals sociological explanation social movements what is a social movement what is a women's movement and what's different for women in social movements these are questions that are difficult to answer in more than provisional terms one tends to speak of movements as actors in themselves the women's movement the peace movement the environmental movement the labor movement add your favorite here giving them a unity of purpose an intention that they never really have movements are not themselves actors movements are something that people create to press for social change they are spaces that are made by people to allow relationships between them that can challenge power sociologists have tended to define and redefine social movement in response to the kind of protests they saw taking place around them american sociologists in the early to mid 20th century characterized movements as being on a continuum of innovative collective behavior as the organized end of a spectrum whose opposite pole was crowds and riots blumper 1939 see also turner and killian 1987 for these scholars known as collective behaviorists social movements were highly organized but non routine entities where people interacted to establish new meanings about politics and other subjects and where they challenged the power based on the making of these new meanings some variations on collective behavior theory emphasized the disorderly side of movement activism seeing actors in movements as problematic for democracy conhorses 1959 mass society theory for example painted protesters as alienated and automatic the product of structurally abnormal nation states hence the mass movements of fascism and communism were both pathological manifestations of ill channeled popular discontent however questions about women's movements and women's participation in mixed gender movements dealt with 
in all these theoretical shifts. We know that women's movements and women in movements have changed history. But we have second wave feminism's academic arm, women's studies, to thank for uncovering women's participation in movements and establishing that women's movements changed political landscapes. The remobilized feminist movements of the 1960s and 70s generated scholars who looked for evidence of women's agency in the past, inspired by the present. And the remobilized second wave feminist movement itself was pivotal to new thinking about movements in sociology. As feminist sociologists contributed to new paradigms based on their research of women's movements and women in movements. See, for example, Freeman's 1975 resource mobilization assessment of second wave white feminism. In a very real way, theorizing about women in movements, particularly but not solely in feminist movements, contributed to new understandings about how movements came about. Feminist social movement scholars have continued to make sure that they make new theory with women's activism in mind, and their work has remained central to the sociology of social movements. Sociological explanation, poverty. The cycle of poverty in sociology is a social trend whereby poverty traumatized individuals show a tendency to remain poor during their lifespan and in many cases across groups. For example, in developing countries, children are often manipulated in the areas of household service, agricultural work and occasionally commercial sex work. Children of poor families who have no access to quality education, drop out of school and enter the works force at engage. Social Darwinian theory of poverty. This is the first theory that emerged within sociology and it tried to explain poverty in terms of the behavior and attitudes of the poor themselves. The poor were poor because they did not work hard. They wasted money on gambling, drinking and unnecessary luxuries and they had disorder of family life. They had no ambition, no inner call for work, very fatalistic and suffered from an intractable ineducability. As the Broke Committee phrased it, cited in Madza 1966 to 94, even a whole nation was conceived in these terms. A more recent supporter of this view has been the US New Right. George Gilder, Murray and Richard Hernstein have argued that the poor are genetically blueprinted to be at the bottom of the social hierarchy. The poor are poor because they have low IQ and low mental capacity and biologically destined to be poor. The welfare system that underwrites this human substratum of deviance is a sheer wastage of resources and should be dismantled. Culture of poverty. The second theory is the theory of culture of poverty developed by Oscar Lewis, an anthropologist in 1959. Lewis developed his theory from his experience of Mexico. The culture of poverty is a specific syndrome that grows up in some situations. It requires an economic setting of cash economy, a high rate of unemployment and underemployment, low wages and people with low skills. In the absence of voluntary or state support and stable family, the low-income population tends to develop the culture of poverty against the dominant ideology of accumulation of the middle class. The poor realize that they have a marginal position within a highly stratified and individualistic capitalistic society which does not offer them any prospect for upward mobility. In order to survive, the poor have to develop their own institutions and agencies because the larger society tends to ignore and bypass them. Thus, the poor come to represent a common set of values, norms and pattern of behavior which is different from the general culture as such. In short, the poor has a way of life, a specific subculture. Lewis found 70 traits that underlay the subculture. He classified these traits into four types. Relationships between the subculture and the larger society. People either disengage or maintain distance from the larger society. They do not belong to labor unions or political parties, go to banks or hospitals or enjoy leisure facilities of the city. They have a high mistrust of the dominant institutions of society. Nature of the slum community. The 
slum communities characterized by poor housing and overcrowding and a minimum of organizational structure beyond the space of family. These institutions grow up mainly to meet their minimum needs. The slum economy is inward looking. It is embedded in pawning of personal goods, informal credit and use of second hand goods. Nature of the family, bilateral kinship system, unstable marriage, matrifocal family. Attitudes, values and personality of the individual. The individual has a strong feeling of fatalism, helplessness, dependence and inferiority. A weak ego tuned to the gratification in the present and a strong preoccupation with masculinity. Once the subculture is formed, it tends to be perpetuated. It is transmitted from one generation to another through socialization. The theory of culture of poverty has been greatly misunderstood and misused. Levy saw it as an extreme form of adaptation that the poor are forced to make under certain circumstances and in certain places. The poor rejects the dominant culture and its institutions because they do not serve them. Their own subculture grows out of despair and protest. Sociological explanation is helpful in situating the beginning of the New Age movement in the mid-60s to the early 70s and in highlighting the relationship between protest movements of that time and the New Age. The problem with this explanation is that it assumes the only reason people pursue spiritual and psychological matters is because they are suffering from some setback in the outer political sphere. Thus. It assumes that if the leftist politics had triumphed, there would have been no need for turning inward. Unfortunately, such a reductionistic explanation is typical of many sociologically inclined academics who dismiss genuine spirituality. Many movement activists of the 60s did grow dissatisfied with political activism and joined what we now call the New Age movement. But instead of arguing that this shift from politics is failure of will, one should see this more as a witness to the inadequacies of our cultural paradigm. The movement activists turned from political activism to spirituality because they found something more satisfying there. Two of the most prominent political activists of the 60s, Rennie Davis and Jerry Rubin, both members of the Chicago 7 illustrate this point. Ren Davis was on his way to Paris to celebrate the end of the Vietnam War when a series of coincidences diverted him to India.